Hi, this is Hank Hennegraff, president of the Christian Research Institute and host of the Bible Answer Man broadcast with another Hank Unplugged Short. For Eastern Christians, today on Pascha, we have arrived at the culmination of Holy Week. For Christians in the West, this Hank Unplugged Short ought to be a great reminder of what you celebrated as the apex of the Christian faith just one short week ago. Again, Pascha, or Easter, is the culmination of Holy Week, a culmination in which you and I, along with the body of Christ throughout the world, celebrate the ultimate game-changer, If I face hardships in life for merely human reasons, what have I gained? For as St. Paul put it, if the dead are not raised, why not just eat and drink? Because after all, tomorrow you're just going to die. If Christ has not been raised, said St. Paul, your faith is futile, you're still dead in your sins, then also... Those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied, pitied more than all men. You see, without resurrection, Christianity crumbles. Thus, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul gives us a four-part argument underscoring the irrevocable reality of the resurrection of our Savior. He begins by passing on the creedal affirmation that Christ died. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. This is not only a well-established fact, but in our modern age of scientific enlightenment, there is virtual consensus among New Testament scholars that Christ did indeed die on the cross, that he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and that his death drove his disciples to despair. In the second of this four-part argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, St. Paul argues that, that Jesus was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. <laughs> in point of fact, the earliest Jewish response to the resurrection presupposes the empty tomb. And of course, in the centuries following the resurrection, the fact of the empty tomb was forwarded by Christ's friends and his foes in similar fashion. Of one thing, you and I can be absolutely certain early Christianity could not have survived an identifiable tomb that contained the relics of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The third part of Paul's argument is that the apostles did not merely propagate Christ's teachings. They were absolutely positive that Christ had appeared to them in the flesh, and that after his death. As such, St. Paul points out that Christ appeared, not just to a few, but to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom, says St. Paul, are still living, though some have fallen asleep. It would have been one thing to attribute these supernatural experiences to people who had already died, quite another, to attribute them to multitudes alive and subject to cross-examination. And then there's the fourth part of his argument. A part in which St. Paul draws attention to his own transformation. Remember, He abdicated his position as an esteemed Jewish leader, as a rabbi, a Pharisee, one who had studied under Gamaliel, the leading authority of the Sanhedrin. 
St. Paul gave up his avowed mission to stamp out every vestige of what he considered to be the insidious heresy of Christianity. And in the end, he paid the ultimate price for his faith. Moreover, in the span of just a few hundred years, a band of seemingly insignificant believers succeeded in turning an empire right side up. While it is conceivable that the disciples would have faced torture and vilification and even cruel deaths for what they fervently believed to be true, it is inconceivable that they would have been willing to die for what they knew to be a lie. Let me also note this. The Jewish rites of Passover and baptism were radically transformed by what? by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so in place of the Passover meal, believers began celebrating the Lord's Supper. Think about this. Jesus had just been slaughtered in the most grotesque and humiliating fashion. And yet the disciples partook of his his true body his true blood, and they did so with joy. Only the resurrection can account for that. Baptism as well. It was radically transformed. Prior to the resurrection, Gentile converts to Judaism were baptized in the name of the God of Israel. After the resurrection, converts to Christianity were baptized in the name of Jesus. And in doing that, They were equating Jesus with the God of Israel. Of one thing you and I can be certain. If 21st century Christians would grasp the reality of resurrection in the same manner that 1st century Christians did, their lives, our lives, would be totally transformed. Why? Because Christ's resurrection was a historical event that took place in our time-space continuum. And in like fashion, your resurrection, my resurrection, will also be a historical event that takes place when Christ physically returns and transforms our mortal bodies. I've said it before, it bears repeating, Neither Ponce de Leon nor Alexander the Great ever discovered the fountain of youth. It does exist, however. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Truly. Truly, for all who are in Christ, the fountain of youth as yet awaits. Thanks for tuning in. Happy Pascha, whether you're celebrating it today or a week ago. Happy Pascha. Celebrate resurrection throughout the remaining days of your life. So long for now.